Each star you see twinkling in the night sky is a luminous sphere of superheated gas much larger than any planet. And each has a story to tell. A traumatic birth, a life on the edge, and a death that rattles the heavens. Like glittering cities in the desert, galaxies arise out of the great darkness of the universe. Galaxies made of billions of blazing lights called stars. But how were these stars born? How will they die? And how can it be that all human beings on Earth owe their lives to the deaths of stars? The quest for answers begins here in a cloud of dust and gas hovering in the interstellar desert. You are looking at the Pillars of Creation. The Pillars of Creation are a stellar nursery. New stars are in the process of being born in the central regions. Located 7,000 light years from Earth, the Pillars are part of the Eagle Nebula which is just one of billions of star-forming regions in the universe. The pillars are towering clouds of dust and hydrogen gas. It's hydrogen, the lightest, simplest, most abundant element in the universe that is the key component of stars. Within a nebula, clumps of this gas and dust slowly coalesce into smaller clouds over millions of years pulled together by a very familiar force. The same force. Each contracting cloud can produce anywhere from a few dozen to thousands of stars. To form a star like our sun, which is a million miles across, it takes a clump of gas and dust a hundred times the size of our solar system. These clouds start off their lives bitterly cold, with temperatures hundreds of degrees below zero Fahrenheit. But as gravity fragments and compresses them, the heat begins to soar. Within a few hundred thousand years, the cloud spins into a flattened disk. Gravity coalesces the center of the disk into a sphere, where the heat rises to a scorching two million degrees. This glowing system is now known as a protostar. 10 million years later, the searing hydrogen core of the fledgling star soars past 18 million degrees, and something incredible happens. The core becomes so hot it can sustain thermonuclear fusion. It's this nuclear reaction that produces the energy to power the star throughout its life giving it a constant source of light and heat. Once born, a star's life will be a constant battle, an all-out war against gravity. Gravity collects the star in the first place, and then gravity wants to crush it. Gravity never gives up. Gravity wants to pull everything together. And so if the star is going to have a life, and a long life, it has to find a way to fight against gravity. You feel gravity all the time when you try to jump or you try to climb a rock. There's always gravity pulling you back down. And in order to fight against gravity, you have to have some way of applying a force which works in the opposite direction of gravity. So if there's a rope, you can use your muscles to pull on the rope and therefore resist and even overcome gravity. But that doesn't mean gravity gives up. Gravity is always working, uh, and so you have to keep applying this force in order to not fall off. And if you give up or let go or the rope breaks, gravity immediately wins and you fall. The same kind of thing happens with stars. Stars are also uh, trying to hold themselves up against gravitational collapse. Gravity wants to crush the star down to the middle. For stars, nuclear fusion provides the rope in the form of pressure. 
the heat gets all the particles in the star moving around quickly and they bang outwards and that produces a pressure which can actually hold the star up against gravity. The amount of pressure pushing out on the star just matches the amount of gravity pulling in on the star and it can sit there and burn happily until something changes. A star will spend most of its life in this state of equilibrium. It's a phase scientists call the main sequence. All stars on the main sequence aren't alike. Some are much smaller and cooler than the Sun. Others much larger and hotter. So it turns out that how hot something is, is related to the color of the light that it emits. So a star like the Sun, most of the light that comes out from the Sun is sort of a yellow type color. If the sun were much hotter, the predominant wavelengths of light would come out into the blue or even into the ultraviolet, and cooler stars emit more red light. Small, cool red stars like Proxima Centauri, the nearest star to the sun, are known as red dwarfs. They can be as little as one-tenth the mass of the sun, with surface temperatures thousands of degrees cooler. Red dwarfs are the most common type of stars in the universe. On the opposite end of the spectrum are the large, blue, main sequence stars. Averaging a surface temperature of 45,000 degrees Fahrenheit, they could be 20 times the mass of the Sun and 10,000 times more luminous. In the life and death of a star, size definitely matters. Imagine two gamblers sitting down at a blackjack table. You would expect the one with the most money, the most fuel to burn, would last the longest. But what if the big time gambler is making huge bets on every hand? And it's always just simply the calculation. How much fuel do you have and at what rate are you converting? The high-mass stars live their lives faster. They burn their candle at both ends. There's life in the fast lane. A high-mass star could die within a million years. While massive stars have lifespans measured in millions of years, the lowest mass stars measure their lives in tens of billions, if not trillions of years. But for all stars, including our own sun, life on the main sequence can't go on forever. It can only last as long as the star has fuel to burn. If it runs out of fuel, fusion stops and gravity wins. Not only does the size of a star influence how long it will live, it also determines how it will die. Massive stars explode from the seed in violent fury, while smaller ones are doomed to slowly fade away. For five billion years, our Sun, a lower-mass, middle-aged star, has been happily burning through its supply of hydrogen fuel. Like a gambler slowly plowing through a pile of chips. Scientists predict that five billion years in the future, our Sun will reach this critical crossroads. Its supply of hydrogen fuel will have been completely exhausted. Nuclear fusion will cease and gravity will begin to crush the star. At that point, the situation is desperate. In order to survive, a sun-like star must find a new source of fuel. It has helium on hand, but in order to start burning helium, the core has to be 10 times hotter than it was during its lifetime burning hydrogen. As it continues to contract inward, Nature throws the star a lifeline. The core actually becomes superheated by the very gravitational pressure that's trying to crush it. When it reaches 180 million degrees, it can start fusing helium into carbon in a desperate gamble to survive. The star, which took 10 billion years to burn through its hydrogen, now powers through its supply of helium in a mere 100 million years. And then the action begins. Runs out of hydrogen, starts fusing helium. Runs out of helium, 
attempts to fuse carbon and will fail. But all the action, all the, well, what's going on now, happens in the last 10% of a star's life. The searing heat of the helium burning actually causes the outer layers of the star to swell. With the core unable to muster any more nuclear fusion, can it possibly survive gravity's crushing grip? As a star the size of our sun dies, it ejects its outer layers. With no nuclear reactions to generate outward pressure, gravity gains the upper hand. The star begins to fall in on itself, like a climber too tired to hold on to his rope. The contracting star finds its ledge in a surprising place, electrons, tiny negatively charged atomic particles. When the core of our dying sun-like star is crushed to about the size of the Earth, this so-called electron degeneracy pressure takes over. Gravity can collapse the star no further. It's left to slowly cool into a bizarre stellar remnant known as a white dwarf. Like this one, Sirius B, which can be seen only faintly aside its companion, Sirius, the brightest star in our sky. A white dwarf is the final stage in the life of a sun-like star, but it's not quite dead yet. It will continue to shine for billions of years as it gradually radiates away a lifetime of energy. That will be the fate of our sun. But some white dwarfs can have one last hurrah, thanks to a friend who lends a helping hand. Because although our sun is a cosmic loner, more than half of all stars travel through life with at least one companion. If a white dwarf is gravitationally bound to another star as part of a binary system, it can essentially steal the lifeblood from its companion. The small but dense white dwarf exerts such a strong gravitational pull that it will start siphoning off a stream of hydrogen gas. If it gathers material from a companion star and it is able to grow in mass, then eventually the mass of the white dwarf can reach an unstable limit, roughly 40% more than the mass of our sun. At that point, the white dwarf undergoes a catastrophic explosion where the whole thing goes off in a blinding flash, what's called a thermonuclear runaway of the entire star. This mammoth explosion is known as a Type 1a supernova. So if our sun were to do this, and it won't, it'll die in a relatively quiet way. But if it were to do this, you'd need sunblock or supernova block of a few billion in order to protect yourself from the blinding flash. University of California Berkeley astronomer Alex Filipenko is one of the world's most successful supernova hunters. His team has found over 600 of them in the past decade. An incredible feat, considering they occur perhaps twice per century in each galaxy. Searching for supernovas is akin to scanning a crowded football stadium with binoculars in hopes of catching the one person who might be taking a flash photograph at a given point in time. If you were to look at each person individually, one by one, you would have a hard time finding the person who happens to be taking a flash photo. Filipenko increases his odds by expanding his search beyond single stars or even single galaxies. To do this, he enlists the help of a very high-tech assistant. So this is a robotic search engine for exploding stars, supernovae. It has been programmed to robotically take photographs of over a thousand galaxies a night. And over the course of a week, it does seven or 8,000 galaxies. And then it repeats the process, comparing the new pictures of each galaxy with old pictures. Now, usually there's nothing new in the new picture, but occasionally a star blows up, a supernova goes off. And then you can see in the new picture, a bright, point of light that wasn't there in any of the old pictures. 
Though a supernova is visually very, very bright, the visible light is only 1% of 1% of the total energy, one ten thousandth of the entire energy emitted by this colossal explosion. Although type 1A supernovas come from exploding white dwarfs, many others, known as type 2 supernovas, signal the dramatic deaths of much more massive stars, perhaps eight or 10 times more massive than the sun. Unlike their smaller cousins, when massive stars exhaust their hydrogen fuel, they have the raw power to start fusing other elements. The ashes of each set of nuclear reactions become fuel for the next, so that near the end of its life, a massive star resembles an onion in cross-section, with an outer layer of the original fuel, hydrogen, surrounding layer after layer of heavier and heavier elements. Within half a second, a core the size of the Earth is crushed into an object roughly 10 miles across. For a moment, the collapsing core rebounds, smashing into the outer layers of the star and kicking off one of the most massive explosions in our universe since the Big Bang. Scientists are convinced that supernovas mean much more to the universe than spectacular light shows. They are, in fact, the source of the heavy elements that make up everything around us. As material from these explosions spread out through the universe, it became the stuff of planets, moons, new stars, and something even more extraordinary. If you could trace your ancestry back to its earliest reaches, you would find an exploding star in your family tree. We are essentially made of star stuff or stardust, as Carl Sagan used to say. The elements in your body, not just generically, but specifically, the elements in your body, heavier than hydrogen and helium, came from long dead stars. The calcium in your bones, the oxygen that you breathe, the iron in your red blood cells, the carbon in most of your cells, all those things were created in stars through nuclear reactions and then ejected by supernovae. And the heaviest elements, iron and above, were produced by the explosions themselves, by the supernovae. While the explosion of a type II supernova showers the universe with heavy elements, the core of the exploding star is left intact. Destroying that is gravity's job. But to crush the core any smaller than the size of a white dwarf, it will have to overcome that strange force, electron degeneracy pressure. Compared to normal stars, neutron stars are cosmic pebbles. They can be as small as 10 miles across. So imagine you take a star about one and a half times the size of our sun, and then you compress all of that material down into a very small space, about the size of Manhattan. You've just made yourself a neutron star. Squeezing that amount of mass into such a small space makes for an extremely dense object. One teaspoonful of neutron star material would weigh a billion tons. Neutron stars are some of the most exciting and weird objects in the universe that uh, astronomers study. If a human being were to stand on a neutron star, it, it would be a somewhat uncomfortable experience. On Earth, if they weighed about 150 pounds, on a neutron star, they would weigh something like 10 billion tons. A biology can't stand that amount of pressure, and so the human being would essentially be squashed flat against the surface of the star. In addition to that, neutron stars are spinning at an incredibly high rate, hundreds of times per second in some cases. It's this rapid spin that enabled astronomers to first identify neutron stars. Some neutron stars are spinning really rapidly, and they have a really amazingly high magnetic field. That magnetic field, together with the spin, forces a bunch of charged particles, electrons, to go along the axis 
of the magnetic field. And those accelerated electrons give off light. They produce a well-focused beam of light. Now, this is like a lighthouse whose beam is always on, but you only see it when the lighthouse beam intersects your line of sight. In a similar way, we might see the shining neutron star only when the beam points at us. That object is called a pulsar. Some stars are so massive, perhaps 25 or 40 times the mass of the sun, that not even a neutron star can hold up under the weight of their collapse. And gravity will crush them even further into an object of infinite density and almost equally limitless fascination, a black hole. This collapse creates a region of space where matter is compressed into such a high density that its gravitational field is inescapable. Scientists have long suspected that there is yet another class of supernova involving even bigger stars and even more powerful explosions, stars that collapse so catastrophically that they leave behind no remnant, not even a black hole. But no one had ever seen one until now. Even after billions of years, the universe is still surprising us with its raw power. In the fall of 2006, astronomers observed the largest stellar explosion ever witnessed by man. 240 million light years away from Earth, a massive star blew itself apart. It's an amazing really powerful explosion. A normal supernova comes from the explosion of a star 10 times more massive than our Sun. In Krenn, Supernova 2006 GY, as astronomers have dubbed it, seems to have signaled the death of a star 150 or even 200 times more massive. That's about as massive as a star can get. Scientists are still studying the aftermath of the explosion, but they think Supernova 2006 GY has a lot to teach us about the first stars that populated our universe. We actually think that the first generation of stars tended to be really massive, and they probably exploded by this mechanism. It's these mega-explosions that likely seeded the early universe with heavy elements. In the cycle of life, not only here on Earth, but in the cosmos, as stars die, particularly those that die spectacular deaths, the high-mass stars that manufactured heavy elements in the cores, those give the seeds of the next generations of stars that then increase the likelihood that that next generation will have planets and planets that contain the ingredients of life itself. Supernovas aren't the only energetic events in the life and death of a star. Right now, across the universe, there are a thousand pairs of stars engaged in brilliant dances of fire. For some, this dance will end in catastrophe. Among the most explosive collisions modeled by astrophysicists is the clash of two orbiting neutron stars. Typically, they're bound together as a pair orbiting one another, and as they orbit, they disturb the space time around them and create waves of energy. And the energy to do that slows the stars down so they get closer and closer together. As they get really close together, they're orbiting around hundreds or even a thousand times per second. The final event is very dramatic. When two neutron stars collide, they're moving at nearly the speed of light. Although the final collision takes only a fraction of a second, it unleashes more energy than the sun will generate in its entire lifetime. Thanks to computer modeling, we can also predict what would happen if a highly dense white dwarf collided with our sun. It would be a frightening collision. When it got close enough, the gravitational field of the white dwarf would start to distort the sun, so the sun would no longer remain a sphere, it would sort of turn into an egg shape as this thing came close. As the white dwarf plows into the sun at supersonic speed, 
its gravity would send an enormous shock wave throughout the star. And that would produce so much thermonuclear energy to essentially explode the sun. Amazingly, it would take only about an hour for the white dwarf to plow through the sun and annihilate it. If this scenario came to pass, life on Earth would be doomed. Fortunately, the chances of this happening are slim because the sun is in a very uncrowded part of the Milky Way galaxy. So it's a complicated traffic situation, but because the space between the stars is so great, there's not much chance of a collision. If you were to wait out here on this beach until you saw the collision between the sun and another star, you would wait a long time. Even over its entire life, the sun is probably a billion and one chance of colliding with another star. But there are places within galaxies where the odds of a collision are much greater. Regions where hundreds of thousands or even millions of stars are crowded together by gravity into a globular cluster. Compared to the spiral arms of the Milky Way, a globular cluster is like a demolition derby. The odds of two stars colliding in the spiral arms of our galaxy are only about one in a billion. But within a globular cluster, stars are packed a million times more densely than elsewhere in the Milky Way. In these crowded, chaotic conditions, stars collide on average once every 10,000 years. Every star in a cluster was born at roughly the same time. So when astronomers look at an old cluster, they don't expect to see any young stars. But strangely, a globular cluster usually conceals some mysterious strangers. Large blue stars, far younger than the small dim stars surrounding them. These seemingly impossible stars are known as blue stragglers. Astrophysicist Joshua Barnes thinks he knows the answer. He believes blue stragglers are the result of collisions between older, dimmer, main-sequence stars. The mutual gravity of the stars locks them in a spiral. They've lost energy of motion and they will come back and have multiple subsequent passages. They heat up and swell up and kind of spiral around each other, making several passes, each closer than the last one, until they finally come together and stars merge. In the end, rather than triggering a catastrophe, the two stars merge to form one more massive star. Uh, what you're basically doing is taking two small old stars, piling them together to make one star now, which is twice as massive, and therefore being more massive, it's brighter and bluer than the rest of the stars in the cluster. So it seems to be straggling behind the rest of the stars. While the mystery of the blue stragglers seems to have been solved, the heavens are bursting with unusual objects that dare science to explain them. Black holes, neutron stars, and white dwarfs all represent the end of remarkable stellar lives. But there are other strange celestial objects that never got a chance to shine. Not quite planets, not quite stars, these are the brown dwarfs. University of Hawaii astronomer Michael Liu searches for these elusive objects. A brown dwarf has the same ingredients as a star, but it simply doesn't have enough mass to sustain nuclear fusion. Without fusion, these failed stars start to act more like planets to date, astronomers have located only a couple hundred brown dwarfs, and they still have many questions about these elusive objects. For one, they know some brown dwarfs have disks of dust and gas around them. Might those disks form into planets? That's just one of many mysteries yet to be solved as we continue to probe the stars. 
But already, science has revealed the universe to be a magical realm of dwarfs and giants, stragglers and supernovas. And hidden within the explosive life story of stars, they have found the very history of the cosmos and a key to understanding our own origins.